We're going to get started. It's a couple minutes after 5 o'clock. Again, my name is Zach Coda. I'm a teacher naturalist at North Branch Nature Center uh, in Montpelier. And I am lucky to do a variety of different things. But one of the things that gets me most excited this time of year is uh, working with our amphibian road crossing program. This is a program where volunteers go out and monitor sites where amphibians are crossing the road and, and our volunteers help collect data and get them across the road safely. Um, but the big piece of uh, them crossing the road is, is where are they going? And a lot of the time that's to a vernal pool. And so we're having this evening to really uh, dive deep into a vernal pool and, and really learn what makes these special places tick. And joining me in this presentation um, is Kevin Tolan, who uh, is the Vernal Pool Monitoring Coordinator at Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Uh, so thank you, Kevin, for joining us tonight, and I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Thank you for everyone uh, who's tuning in. Uh, what, 60 people here. It's a great turnout. Um, so thank you so much for that. Yeah, as Zach mentioned, I'm from Vermont Center for Eco Studies. I'm an AmeriCorps member there currently. I work with Vernal Pools and grassland birds primarily, doing outreach for grassland birds with landowners. Um, and then, as Zach mentioned, I coordinate the Vernal Pool Monitoring Program for Vermont Center for Eco Studies, which we'll mention uh, a little bit later in the presentation. I just want to kind of jump right into it and um, get started. So, yes, Vernal Pools in Vermont. What, what is a vernal pool? We have some people in the chat that have been to several before, some people that have never been to one. So before we really start talking about vernal pools, I kind of want to establish what we're talking about. So vernal pools are bodies of water um, that have a seasonal wet and dry cycle. So they're not a permanent lake generally. Um, they are going to be a lowland area that floods when snow melts in the spring and when the April showers come. And then, for the most part, will dry almost completely, if not completely, um, in July, August, and it may reflood later. But that's really what constitutes the beginning of a pool. Second, which really adds to that, is there's no permanent inlet or outlet. Um, that would kind of that would add water to it year round for the most part. So it can be a little trickle during the spring, like a little seasonal spring, but it can't be permanent. And that really also goes into this next part where there can't be fish present. And that's really the biggest one. I think that both these other, um, both the other criteria really feed into fish are predators that will eat a lot of amphibian eggs or tadpoles. And so they really can't be present. And these amphibians that we're going to talk about have evolved in the absence of fish. So they just can't be present. And when you have a seasonal wet dry cycle, so the, so the pool's not always full with water. That just kind of means that fish can't survive there because fish always need water. And same thing with the permanent inlet or outlet. If there's just no way for fish to get into the pool, they just can't be there. So that's kind of when we talk about vernal pool, that's really what we're talking about. Amphibians, certain ones can breed in different types of bodies of water, but we're not focusing on those. We're focusing on a smaller subset that really can only breed in these fishless temporary wetlands. Uh, so kind of talked about what a pool is. Now let's look at what it looks like. And vernal pools can form in a variety of ways. Uh, for one, they can um, form when there's a depression in the bedrock. So when the water generally surface runoff, uh, like as I said, from rainfall or melting snow, when it reaches that lowland area in the bedrock, it can't drain through effectively, so it just floods and stagnates there. That's a little bit different than this other type um, that's a little bit of a lowland below the water table. And so when the water table rises in the spring, the pool will flood. And then in the summer, when the water table lowers, the pool will dry. Those are kind of two different types of vernal pools. One of them is fed by surface runoff, and one of them is fed primarily by groundwater. There is usually some overlap between the two that a pool will be affected by both. 
But when I think about vernal pools, that's kind of how I think about them by like categorizing them from one to the other. Um, a little bit of a mix of that is this next type uh, where there's just a really, uh, an area of really compacted soils, such as, a, you know, like a clay, something that really uh, fine silt that water can't drain through. And then you have the pooling from like almost like a bedrock. You have a pooling area where the water settles and can't leave. But then also there may be some effect from the water table rising and lowering. So there is a little interplay between the two. And then increasingly now, um, as humans start developing more and more places, vernal pools are developing in impound ditches or um, you know quarries or these really human generated uh, areas. And they can either be really productive or just terrible for amphibians. On one hand, uh, they can be more productive than, you know, not having a pool at all, of course. But if they dry too early, such as um, a rut from a skitter in the woods, if you have frogs that go and lay their eggs there, the pool will dry up, you know, way before it would if it was a naturally existing pool, leaving all those eggs and tadpoles to die. So they can cause a little bit of a sink um, for populations that rely on them too heavily. A couple of pictures of vernal pools through the seasons. Um, this is one I believe in Mont. One I think it's Middlebury from one of my uh, one of my vernal pool monitors. So in the winter, um, as I said, it it will usually dry um, in the summer, and then when it gets cooler out in the fall, it may reflood. So a lot of times in the winter, you'll either see kind of like this um, wet, slushy, snowy area where the pool is, if you can see anything at all. So you see it's a pretty long pool. It's, it's downhill from a lot of hills. So it's probably catching a lot of surface runoff in that watershed, um, which is also another important thing that vernal pools do. Next, this is one more in this, this time of year, maybe a little bit, you know, maybe more like May. Uh, you can see it's a lowland in the forest. There's a good amount of downed woody debris in the pool, which is pretty important for amphibians. They really like that that uh, that structure and that extra cover, um, and you see some pretty nice lush green forest around it. There's a little bit of a, there's some sedges popping out of the water, so a pretty diverse uh, vegetation community around this pool. This is kind of more just like a swampy area. There might be a seep here. Uh, it's more likely just um, a depression that fills from runoff. It doesn't look too deep. You see a lot of mosses and stuff here. It's a lot of uh, primary productivity. So it's really a, the healthy environment when you have that much lush green growth. This is going to be more uh, probably June, July. You see the water's really starting to dry. The, the vegetation isn't as lush green. It's just kind of starting to get like this muddy pit. So this is when you see it, and there's going to be tons of mosquitoes in there, and it just doesn't look the most inviting, you know, the, the most beautiful area of the woods. But it, it really is for a good part of the year. Um, but they just sometimes, you know, they just are look kind of just like muddy mud pits, but that's part of their beauty. And then this is really when you look in, um, like, mid-August, just weak without any water. It's hot. Um, it looks like it's a bit of an opening. So there's no, um, uh, no like tree canopy to really obscure direct sunlight. So it might be evaporating pretty quickly as well. So this is when you barely see them. You can't even really recognize that they're here for, you know, a good part of the year because they just, they're not there. You see where they're, where they're kind of their outline basin was, but you just don't see the pool because it's just not there. It's all, it's all gone. And that's part of that seasonal wet and dry cycle that I mentioned earlier. This is an example of a man-made uh, vernal pool it's from Pennsylvania uh, Natural Heritage Program, I believe. They're doing research of some sort, so they created these pools for that, um, to act as like a baseline, I believe. You can see this is an example of a human-created pool. It's just a dugout trench, really, that floods with water, and it's that easy to make a pool. Depending on uh, the the surf, the uh, the hydrology, the vegetation around it, it could either be very productive or very bad. So it's really kind of fickle when you're doing these human created ones, which makes restoration of vernal pools pretty hard as well. 
So that's a little bit of a background on Vernal Pools. Uh, now I'm going to talk about like why why is half my job Vernal Pools? Like why are they important? And obviously they're they're important if we're talking about them. There's a lot of research, a lot of conservation going into them. So they're a really nice habitat for a lot of species. Some species that we'll talk about later spend their entire life in only vernal pools. Some migrate there seasonally. Some just kind of use it because it's there, such as this, uh, this owl there from a trail cam on one of our monitored pools. Um, and we think about amphibians congregating one place, um, you know, once a year to breed, them all leaving, and then there's now all these growing amphibians in the water, that's a pretty good hunting ground for lost species as well. So you have a lot of birds, raccoons, like those kind of middle, the tier predators. You know, you're not going to see necessarily a wolf coming here eating tadpoles, but you'll definitely see a raccoon maybe going for some. So it's also just a great food source for lost species that don't rely on it for breeding, but they rely on it partially for another part of their life cycle. Uh, vernal pools also help amphibians to disperse across the landscape. Other than the, uh, the breeding animals that rely there, there's a lot of uh, species of amphibians, such as bullfrogs, that only live in more permanent bodies of water. And so if there's two large wetlands that are separated by 10 miles, a bullfrog probably couldn't make that trip because there'd be no place to hide and stay moist, uh, you know, in the heat of the day or whatever, if it's a couple of days between the two wetlands. But if you have a scattering of vernal pools that are separating those two large breeding habitats, it can use it as stepping stones. And so you find amphibians that don't breed in vernal pools that use them to get from one place to the other um, because they might be able to hide under leaf litter to stay moist for like, you know, a day. But when they're going long, longer distances, they need uh, a very, you know, a, a stable place that they can rest and, uh, and escape the dry heat. Uh, Vernal pools also offer some really good ecosystem services. I mentioned that they kind of act as catch basins for, uh, for water in a watershed, and that does a lot to help with flood buffering. Keeps all the water from just running off the leaf litter downhill to wherever it go. It holds water in place. Um, also with runoff mitigation in that, it will kind of sequester water, let silts kind of uh, settle down. Um, and then the water will just evaporate out, so it will um, help keep it from going anywhere. I'll just catch it. And then nutrient cycling is another really big role of vernal pools that people don't necessarily think about a lot because you don't really think about the interactions that happen sometimes. You, you know that there's, you know, there's salamanders and there's tadpoles, yeah. But there's tons of, um, like, tons of invertebrates, algaes, vegetation in the pool as well. And so you see this graphic here. It's a really complex food web that brings nutrients from primary productivity in the water. Then either the amphibians mature and leave the water, bringing the nutrients from an aquatic to a terrestrial ecosystem. Or you have something like a raccoon or a predator will come, eat that, and bring that to a terrestrial ecosystem. So it's a really important method of getting nutrients kind of through different types of ecosystems and environments um, all by natural means. And when you have vernal pools all over the landscape, there's a lot of that that's happening. Uh, I don't, I'm not too sure timing wise on that, but we are taking some questions yeah. now. If anyone has anything they want to ask about any of that vernal pool background knowledge, any questions about stuff like that. Um, it's be a great time to ask. And folks can uh, feel free to ask questions throughout um, the presentation using the chat box, and uh, I'll, I'll help field those. Uh, or if you want, at the end, we'll have a longer question period where folks can unmute themselves and ask. Uh, Kevin, we have a question asking how similar or different are vernal pools to marshes or, or perhaps other wetlands? I'd say it's not a matter of similarity. I say that some marshes are vernal pools. So you could have a vernal pool within a marsh, 
you could almost have a marsh within a vernal pool. Um, so there, it's kind of different categorizations of the same thing. So a vernal pool is, it's like the physical pool itself, but it's also kind of a character, characterization of any body of water. So um, when I, the way that we're looking at for our work primarily is, are there vernal pool indicator species that are breeding there? And that's going to be some of the amphibians and invertebrates that we're going to talk about. But when you're doing, and that's, that's, that's a big part of all vernal pool assessments. But if you're applying for permits to do um, development within a certain area of a vernal pool, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, there's a whole host of things that they use to determine if it's a vernal pool. And those parameters can apply to a variety of different types of wetlands. So marsh or, uh, you know, a bog or, you know, the, uh, just a classic depression in the, uh, in the, in the forest floor. We have a, another question that I might try and answer real quick from uh, Flynn Avenue asking, what makes the cloudiness in some vernal pools? It seems too early for pollen. Um, I visited a vernal pool the other day that had a ton of algae growth in it. So uh, some of that, that cloudiness may come from, from algae growing um, in it. Uh, and then another question before we move on. Some amphibians seem to be headed where there are no vernal pools. Uh, and uh, that is true. They uh, travel quite a ways sometimes to get to their vernal pool. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit uh, later about how far these um, animals go and exactly where they are going. Um, for now, I'm going to move on. Uh, Bronwyn... Cook, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We're, we're in the works, but we'll talk about that. She asked yeah. if there, uh, they asked if there was a map of vernal pools, but we're, we're, we'll talk about that as well. Um, and I'm going to uh, switch here and take over presenting as um, we, we talk about um, the, the specific animals and organisms that live in a vernal pool. Moving through here. Um, so we, when we talk about the different organisms that are living in a vernal pool, we talk about two groups, the obligate vernal pool species or the indicator species and the facultative vernal, spool, vernal pool species. The obligate or the indicator species are species that require this vernal pool in order to complete their life cycle. Species like the mole salamanders that we have here in Vermont, they really need uh, this vernal pool in order to complete their life cycle. Versus the facultative species that we'll talk about later, those species use vernal pools often, but there are other places that they can live too. They're not um, solely reliant on a vernal pool. Uh, here in Vermont, one of the earliest species that are returning to our vernal pools, sometimes even in, in March, depending on the weather, are wood frogs. These are amazing animals that spend most of their lives in the forest. They're, they're our most terrestrial um, frog, uh, other than American toad, and they are spending most of the winter frozen solid. And as soon as it's warming up, it, you know, once it gets to about 40 degrees and uh, it's a little bit wet so they can move through the forest, they're going to migrate to these vernal pools. And they're sometimes arriving at the vernal pools while they're still half frozen. But that doesn't matter. There still might be ice on top of the pool. Um, as long as there's a little bit of open water, they're going to they're gonna start to court and breed. Uh, and when they're breeding, they're going to be uh, uh, having these egg masses. These, these egg masses end up being about the size of a softball, and they have uh, anywhere from a couple hundred to a few hundred eggs in them. And now if you notice, you see that you can, you can see each individual egg. Some of these are, the, the actual embryo is a little black dot in a, in a round, uh, clear uh, 
uh, inner matrix. Uh, and there's nothing holding the entire um, egg mass together around the outside. You can see each individual egg. Uh, but still, these eggs are, are fairly firmly kind of glued together. So when you pick them up, they hold their shape fairly well. Um, and they're, they're really round. They, they're, they really do look kind of softball-like. And they're often uh, clumped around uh, either woody debris or the, the bottom of a cattail or something like that. And you can see on the right, wood frogs are, are pretty much throughout the entire state in almost every town. Uh, like I said, they're, they're containing several hundred eggs apiece. When the wood frog lays them, the egg mass is actually about the size of a quarter. So when it comes out of the frog, it's not terribly big, but what happens is uh, it quickly takes on water, and as it absorbs water, it expands uh, quite a bit. Um, and these eggs are going to develop and hatch in about two to four weeks, depending on the temperature of the pool, how much sun it has, and then there are going to be hundreds and thousands of little wood frog tadpoles uh, swimming around this vernal pool for a few more weeks after that. One of the amazing things that happens are, are wood frogs are all in the same vernal pool and they lay their eggs together so that the egg masses will create these huge rafts um, and you'll get uh, several hundred egg masses, each with um, hundreds of eggs in them. So you end up with tens or hundreds of thousands of wood frog eggs in a vernal pool. Uh, and this raft um, of eggs uh, has a couple benefits. If it, the vernal pool were to freeze over, like I said, they're returning really early to the vernal pool. So sometimes they'll have a cold snap and it'll freeze. And maybe the top, you know, inch or two inches of eggs um, that are floating um, will die from that freezing. But the eggs that are on the bottom of this raft will survive. And what can also happen if the vernal pool starts to dry too quickly before the eggs have all hatched, um, the, having this big raft will mean that maybe the eggs on the outside of the raft will dry up, but they kind of protect the eggs on the inside and keep them insulated with moisture so that those inner um, egg masses can survive some drying. Another one of our uh, vernal pool amphibians is the spotted salamander. This one is, is a really exciting one to see moving to these vernal pools. They're spending their, most of their lives underground, um, and they're returning often to the same vernal pool year after year. Um, for a salamander that can live, you know, 20 years, um, some of them are returning to the same site 95% of the time. Um, which is, is pretty incredible. They um, are courting in the vernal pool in the spring, so they're returning a little bit later than the wood frogs. Uh, they do this amazing courtship where the males are dancing and releasing pheromones. The males are then laying sperm packets down in the bottom of the vernal pool and then kind of herding the females toward their sperm packet. And if she likes what she sees, she'll actually pick that packet up and use it to fertilize her eggs. And once she's done that, um, oh, and you can see there, uh, they're found pretty extensively in almost every uh, town in Vermont. Um, once she's fertilized her eggs, she's laying um, a cluster of anywhere from a few dozen uh, eggs to a few hundred eggs. Younger females are laying fewer the older that they get, um, the more eggs that they're laying. Uh, you can still see each of those individual black embryos, and there's a, a little inner clear or opaque matrix around each embryo, but then there's this really thick outer matrix that surrounds the whole mass of eggs so that you can't actually touch each individual egg like you could in a wood frog. And that thick outer matrix um, there's a couple things that it prevents them from drying out prematurely, um, and it also prevents predators from getting in there. So a spotted, a spotted turtle, which is often a, a vernal pool predator, can't get in and at those individual eggs like it could um, the wood frog eggs. And what that means is 
that when you take one of these spotted salamander egg masses out of the water, which it's okay to, to lift um, an egg mass out of the water uh, briefly, when you lift it out of the water, it holds its shape and, and it feels really firm to the touch. Uh, usually they're attached to sticks and weeds and, it, and again, they take a few weeks to hatch and that three to six week time period really has to do with the conditions of the pool, how, how warm it is, how much sunlight is it getting. Um, and that affects how fast the eggs and then the larva are developing. Related to the spotted salamanders are, are Jefferson salamanders. They're about the same size, but you can see there are this kind of blue-gray overall, and they have this laterally compressed tail. If you can see, that tail kind of looks like it's been squeezed, so it's uh, thin. Um, they're much more scattered throughout the state. Uh, they're a, a species of greatest conservation need, and they're really a lower elevation species. Um, I've seen spotted salamander egg masses in a puddle on top of Hunger Mountain in Waterbury. Uh, you're not going to get Jefferson salamander eggs up that high. They're really, um, you know, a thousand feet or lower. Um, but in earlier moving species too, so you may get Jefferson salamander species moving a little bit earlier in the season, closer to when you're finding wood frogs on the move. And they're laying fewer eggs in a cluster, anywhere from five to 30 eggs. Um, the eggs are, you can see they're, they're tightly compacted in there, and there is a, a, cl a clear outer matrix around them, but it's not that that thick, firm matrix that is surrounding the spotted salamander eggs. Also attached to sticks and taking a similar time to develop. Uh, here's a picture from a vernal pool down in Starksboro um, from last, uh, last weekend. So already Jefferson salamanders uh, have laid eggs down there. Uh, and you can see they are really runny. When you pick it up out of the, out of the, the vernal pool, they have this kind of drippy quality to them, not that, that firm quality that the spotted salamander eggs have. A close relative of the Jefferson salamander is the blue spotted salamander. The blue spotted salamanders are a little bit smaller than the Jeffersons. You can see that they're darker overall. They're much more of a black than a blue gray. And they're covered with all these beautiful um, blue, bright blue spots. They almost look like granite ware with those blue spots on black. And their tail, if you look, the tail is much more rounded uh, than that Jefferson salamander that has that really thin, compressed tail. And this is another species that has a, has a, a really interesting range in Vermont, um, most commonly found in the lower Connecticut River Valley and in the Champlain Valley, but a few spots um, throughout the rest of the state. I think there are probably a lot more communities that have blue spotted salamanders. It's just they haven't been found or documented in those towns yet. So if you see your town up there in white, here's your opportunity to go look and find a new record in your community. They're laying a lot fewer eggs in a, in a cluster, so two to five eggs. They, they maybe are laying more different clusters, um, but only two to five eggs in a cluster um, in, that, in a really thin outer matrix. So you can sort of see the different... Uh, layers in that the, the darker embryo in the middle, an inner matrix, and then a thin outer matrix surrounding all three eggs in that picture. Um, often on the bottom of the vernal pool and maybe underneath a leaf, so it's a lot harder to find than the, the big bunches of spotted salamander eggs. Now what happens with these two species is um, interbreeding, so is our hybrids between the blue spotteds and the Jeffersons. And they create this kind of inter, um, th this, uh, this salamander that has characteristics of both. So maybe a lot of blue uh, specking on it, but still that flat Jefferson salamander tail. Uh, and oftentimes these are all female populations um, within that, the, um, within, uh, that hybrid population. And they only need one male from either species to, to fertilize the eggs, um, but you get these, these uh, interbreeding 
um, salamanders, and it's it's sometimes really hard to tell um, what's going on genetically. Can I can I make a quick interjection on that? Sure. Cool. Can you go back to the other slide? Absolutely. So they don't they're not actively interbreeding. They interbred sometime like three million years ago. Um, and then the all female populations have continued down for three million years. Um, and there are also three other species that are involved in the species complex. So it's a it's 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 the only instance of this kleptogenesis in the in the vertebrate world. So definitely something to look into. It's it's really it's really interesting. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a fascinating genetic mess going on. Um, and so when we have uh, folks reporting these two species, um, you know, we ask them to submit um, photos along with it so we can kind of um, guess what's going on. But oftentimes we just say it's in that complex and we mm. can't tell exactly which species it is. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> then we have some other species that they aren't obligate vernal pool species. They can use other habitats too, um, but they're often found in vernal pools. So these include like spring peeper. Spring peepers will breed in bigger wetlands, but they, they um, will use vernal pools as well. And four-toed salamanders um, will sometimes show up at vernal pools, but often are associated with larger, very specific lowland wetland, um, lowland forest wetlands. Um, and then one that's just south of us in southern New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and even in New York State, but still hasn't been documented fully in Vermont, is marbled salamander. It's another mole salamander that's related to spotted salamanders and blue spotted salamanders uh, and Jefferson salamanders, um, but it has that beautiful black uh, color with these kind of silver bands or, or, or blotches on its back. Um, it differs from the other mole salamanders in that it is doing its courtship and its migration to the vernal pools in the fall. So on, on rainy nights in September and October, the marbled salamanders are moving to vernal pools. They're doing their courtship, they're breeding, and then they're laying eggs in the fall. And the eggs are overwintering in the vernal pool so that as soon as that pool fills up in the spring, the eggs are starting to develop and um, will often be the first uh, eggs to hatch. And they're able to complete their life cycle in the vernal pool uh, sooner in the spring uh, than other species are. And if you think about it, marbled salamanders are more likely to be found, are, are south of us um, in places where it's warmer, it's sunnier, and vernal pools are, are drying up quicker in the season. So that, allow, that, that um, fall movement of the marbled salamanders allows them to jumpstart uh, their, their spring development. Uh, can, and, can you go back to the marbled salamander? Yeah. The, uh, the nearest marbled salamander to Vermont that's like, like recorded um, is like 15 miles south yeah. in Massachusetts. So literally one nice south facing hill in, you know, like way down south there, we might have them. We just need to get out and look for them. But yeah, like 10, 15 miles south we have them. Yeah, I'm sure if you went um, on, if, if you tried really hard on some uh, rainy nights in September and October down in like Guilford and Halifax and Vernon, Vermont, that's, you know, kind of southeastern corner of the state, you would probably find a marbled salamander. Um, and that would be super exciting because it would be the, the first in Vermont. Yeah, we have, there's so, one record, there's a, it's a photo of a marbled salamander, and on the back it says Vermont. No yeah. date, no other location, so it's, it's, we don't, I mean, take that with a grain of salt. Like, that's, that's not really great evidence. Yeah, so that's a challenge for all of you southeastern Vermont folks. Yes. Um, so here's, uh, when we talk about the phenology or the timing of these amphibians, um, we're looking at in, this, in Vermont at, in three different areas. So kind of the southern and central parts of Vermont, which is in green, the Champlain Valley in orange, and then the Northeast Kingdom in red. Uh, and we're looking at that because the Champlain Valley tends to be warmer on average and things are moving soon, 
are quicker. So wood frogs, which are the earliest to move, may be moving in the Champlain Valley as early as um, the, the third week of March um, versus spotted salamanders, which are the last to move in the Northeast Kingdom, which is the coldest part. You may have spotted salamanders still moving in Vermont um, in the, the, you know, the uh, third week of May or even into, um, into uh, early and mid-June. Um, so you have um, in the state as a whole about a three-month period um, or even a little bit longer where amphibians are on the move to these vernal pools. So um, it's hard to predict, you know, statewide to say when things are moving, um, but it's, uh, it can be a pretty extensive migration throughout the whole spring. Some other species that are using vernal pools, uh, caddisfly larvae um, are these, uh, the, the aquatic larvae of a caddisfly in the vernal pools and sometimes other wetlands, but they are a really good clue to signal that you found a vernal pool. Um, and they're small, they're, they're less than an inch, and what's really amazing about these caddisflies is that they are constructing their own homes out of materials um, in the pool, so vegetation, little tiny twigs, um, pebbles, uh, and they're found pretty quickly after the vernal pool is thawed out. Yeah, I, I took that picture, the last picture, I took that picture yesterday. So yeah. they're, they're out there. They, over, they overwinter as larvae, so as soon as they, so they'll get moving before the ponds even, is even uh, iced out. So they're, they're there real quickly. Yeah, they're, they're super cool with their little homes. Um, another species that um, is a really clear indicator of a vernal pool are fairy shrimp. Uh, these, these little tiny animals um, are, uh, for many species, they're reliant on vernal pools, and some, their eggs uh, cannot hatch unless they have thoroughly desiccated, so they've dried out completely, and have frozen. And so those are characteristics of a vernal pool um, that have, you know, th uh, thawed out and gone through a winter cycle. Um, so these, these animals are, are obligate vernal pool species. They need vernal pools. And they've been found in about 5% of the vernal pools mapped in Vermont. Fairy shrimp are kind of like extremophiles. They're related to um, like, you know, like sea monkeys and brine shrimp. Um, so when you think about, they either live in hyper saline environments or they live in seasonal wetlands. So kind of two extremes, but they are, either way, they rely on some pretty extreme environments relative to other species. Yeah, they're, they're pretty amazing uh, little animals. Um, we want to make sure, though, when we're looking for fairy shrimp, um, which are very clear indicators of a vernal pool, that we're not mistaking um, mosquito larva for fairy shrimp, which can be about the same size and have a similar color and shape. Uh, so that's something we want to look very closely um, to, to make sure we're not mistaking the two. I want to be cognizant of the time, so I'm going to keep moving fairly quickly um, and make a couple more points. Um, fingernail clams are another uh, vernal pool indicator. They're in about 20% of the vernal pools that have mapped, um, and they are even burying down underneath the leaf litter, and you can find them in a vernal pool that has um, dried out completely. So that's one thing where if the vernal pool is dry, you may not find any amphibians living there, um, but you may be able to dig through the leaf litter um, and find some of these fingernail clams which tell you that there was indeed a vernal pool, uh, even if there's no water left. Um, some other things that are finding their way to a vernal pool are these water beetles. Uh, they're pretty amazing. Some of them are eating the other invertebrates that are in vernal pools. Um, bigger things like predaceous water beetles, um, you know, some, of the, some of the larger ones are, um, are actually eating the amphibian larva or eggs as they're developing. Um, we have the larval dragonflies and damselflies. So these uh, animals are, are laying their eggs in the vernal pool and we'll have these, uh, these dragonfly larvae that are, that are hunting uh, around the vernal pool. 
here's a couple of the different species of dragonflies that you might find associating with the vernal pools and some of the damselflies as well. They really are super divor diverse um, ecosystems. You know, a vernal pool may be only a few yards across, but has a whole host of amazing organisms living in it. A couple more invertebrates too, these back swimmers, um, which you see that the top side is, is kind of this white color with an interesting pattern on it. They're moving around as well as water boatmen in these vernal pools. And I want to highlight a couple other species that are not obligate vernal pool um, indicators, but um, are these facultative species that are, that are using vernal pools um, and are often found in around them. Spotted turtles uh, are in their range, and Vermont does have some spotted turtle populations. They love vernal pools. They actually travel quite a ways from the wetlands where they spend the winter, so they, maybe they spent the winter in a, in a, in a little um, wetland area. They'll move out and even up to a mile and a half across the land to get to a vernal pool because it has such uh, great hunting for them, and that can sustain them through the summer months. Uh, so you'll get these spotted turtles that are, are hunkering down in vernal pools um, and using vernal pools like stepping stones to get to other wetlands. And similarly, uh, eastern screech owls and other owl species really love vernal pools. There is that abundance of food at just the right time when they're in the middle of nesting and raising young. So there's actually some really great studies in other parts of the range of eastern screech owl, not here in Vermont, that have shown um, that they nest will nest close to vernal pools and that... Um, Eastern screech owls that nest close to vernal pools are able to rear more young in a given year uh, than eastern screech owls in other habitat types because there is such an abundance of food like that um, screech owl that's about to feed its, its, uh, its young a uh, tree frog there. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll gladly answer questions that folks have about um, the species that are living in vernal pools. Um, how far will spotted turtles migrate to different wetlands? Yeah, they will. Um, I, I was just reading about them migrating a mile and a half out from their wetland um, to a vernal pool uh, just because it's such good, um, such good uh, food uh, in that vernal pool. And then what is the best way to catch and find a spotted salamander? Well, I think the best way to find spotted salamanders is when they're moving. So you can go to road crossings, places where they're moving from their wintering ground to these vernal pools. And uh, I uh, recorded um, uh, another presentation a few weeks ago all about um, amphibian migration, and you can access that um, on North Branch Nature Center online. So I'll, um, I'll uh, link to that, uh, our website where you can find that other presentation as well. Um, and then, yeah, barred owls definitely at vernal pools. Uh, I'm going to answer a couple questions in the chat as I uh, turn it back to uh, Kevin to finish our presentation here. Sweet. Thank you. Let me see if I can figure this out. Um, let's see. There it goes. Cool. Yeah, so thank you for all of that. Um, we're going to round it up now. Um, just kind of talking about management practices um, and some like the just more background information on the status of conservation of vernal pools in Vermont. Um, oh, geez. I was not keeping up. management hey Kevin you're muted oh my bad sorry <laughs> I didn't know I was muted um cool 
Jeez, where'd my thing go? This is not going well. Cool. Yeah, so Liverpool management. Management goals. Basically, to just leave it in a undisturbed natural state. So you want to leave the vernal pool depression, which is where the vernal pool itself forms in an undisturbed state. And you want to make sure that the upland habitat where the amphibians live outside of breeding is maintained as well. When you think about the amphibian life cycle, you know, 95% of their life is spent out of the vernal pool. So to conserve vernal pool amphibians, you have to conserve their entire life cycle. So you need to do both their breeding habitat and their non-breeding habitat. And the conservation and management in the two looks different. Um, for vernal pool itself, for the depression where it floods, you basically you don't want to take any, uh, any timber out of there. You don't want to allow machinery there um, for numerous reasons. It may affect the hydro period. Um, it may cause ruts that may um, cause the pool to, to leak or uh, not maintain water as well. And then you don't want to add excess woody debris into the pool, such as treetops. Um, if you are harvesting trees there, because that excess wood will change the water chemistry um, and may introduce some pathogens. Um, so you really just want to leave the vernal pool itself alone. Um, when you're doing forestry and silviculture out of the vernal pool, but still within um, about 400 feet of the vernal pool, you still want to be careful because that 400 feet from the pool is where spawned salamanders that breed there will spend most of their life. Um, it's called the amphibian life zone. It's like 400 feet to 500 feet from the vernal pool is basically going to be most of the spawned salamanders, most of the Jefferson salamanders, um, and the majority, but not all, of the wood frogs. So you want to keep a pretty nice closed canopy there. That will keep the forest floor shaded, um, keep it a little bit moister, which helps the amphibians move. Um, will keep the temperature a little bit lower as well. So you really don't want to be causing big openings in the canopy if you can avoid it, because then you'll have just walk, these large patches of hot, dry soil and leaf litter that really is not conducive to amphibian survival. Uh, and you also want to avoid causing uh, bare soil because then any rain that falls will run off the bare, the bare soil, pick up silt and bring that to the vernal pool. And um, that's not healthy for the environment or for the vernal pool. It will um, introduce unneeded nutrients um, and just causing siltation just never good. Um, and then, as I mentioned way back in the beginning of the, of the presentation, um, man-made, you know, ruts or um, depressions that really will flood and then evaporate quickly can cause uh, population sinks. So you don't want to be causing large ruts with, say, skitters or any other uh, machinery uphill or in the vicinity of a vernal pool. And to avoid this, if you only harvest on frozen ground, uh, then the ground won't, you know, it's not going to be all moist. It's not going to have ruts. It's not going to really wear off anything, um, not really kill any major vegetation for the most part. The roots will be protected. So if you're harvesting or managing your woods near a vernal pool, you really want to do it in the winter. This is a diagram um, that kind of demonstrates what that management would look like. The, uh, the, forest area to the left is kind of an unmanaged area. So within 100 feet of the vernal pool, there's about 89% canopy cover. Within the 400 foot buffer zone that I mentioned, there's 95% canopy cover. And then you see after uh, uh, thinning, after a forestry treatment, and within the 100 feet of the pool, it goes down to 75% canopy cover. So it's still relatively high. It's not, you know, it's obviously less than when it's unmanaged. But that's still a good amount of canopy cover. They'll keep the pool at a good temperature. We'll keep uh, the soil and the ground pretty moist and maintained. Uh, you know, a healthy, uh, livable condition for the amphibians. And then in the 400-foot buffer, so the 100 to 300 feet area out from the pool, you go down to about 55% canopy cover. So that's obviously only about half. It's much less than in the natural state, but it's still okay. Um, it's it's survivable for most amphibians in that 400 feet area. Um, 
both while they are, um, you know, when they're migrating and when they're living out of the vernal pool for the summer, fall, winter. This is where the 400 foot comes from. Um, this graphic shows that uh, the different the different dispersal distances to a pool for different amphibians. The marbled salamander is the is the shortest, um, but we don't have that in Vermont to the best of our knowledge. Spotted salamander is just under 400 feet, so that's where that 400 foot buffer comes from. Jefferson's a little bit more, about 475, and then wood frog is the furthest at. 633 so even though they move they really don't move far from their from their selected vernal pool so i've mentioned uh, someone's question earlier that they found a uh, spotted salamander near a vernal pool and if that meant that that's probably where it bred and i said yes because they can't travel far distances so they probably are breeding at whatever vernal pool they are near there's some great resources for People with questions on management, uh, Maine Audubon and Maine state government have done some great stuff. Um, so this forestry habitat management guidelines for vernal pool wildlife is for free on the, uh, it's for free off the Maine Audubon website. We have this suggested guidelines for timber harvesting on our Vermont Center for Eco Studies website. And then the county foresters that each Vermont county has also are a great resource just get consultation or second opinion um, if you have any any questions about about forestry treatments. Getting toward the end here, try and speed through these last part. Legal protections, um, vernal pools are wetlands. So they do have certain legal protections. Um, vernal pools are automatically uh, considered a class two wetland. So it's not as significant as a class one, but it still does get protection. This uh, statute basically establishes a 50-foot buffer around any amphibian breeding habitat. So you can't build or, you know, fill in anything or really do any major development um, within that 500, within that, sorry, 50-foot buffer um, without a permit. And then silvicultural activities, though, are not limited. So you can still go in and still force, uh, still, uh, do forestry activities within that 50 foot buffer um, without a special permit. But it's, you need to, I'm not entirely sure. I think you need to follow the, uh, the, best, the best practices and you need to consult your county forester. Uh, now I mentioned the Vernal Pool Monitoring Project earlier. So I'm just going to put a quick plug in for that. Um, we have about 50 to 60 pools across the state right now that are part of a long-term um, study trying to get some more information on uh, you know, vernal pools in the state, try to raise awareness for them, and have uh, citizen, citizen scientists involved. Um, so if you're interested in this, you'd please contact me. It's about, it's really four visits. You do three visits in the spring, one in the fall, um, and you're kind of looking at the species that are breeding there. We track the hydro period, the temperature, some other, um, some other things. So please reach out to me if you're interested in that. And then uh, we mentioned earlier that there's going to be a statewide map of vernal pools. And this is a really exciting thing that we just put out this past month, the Vernal Pool Atlas. It's a collab between Vermont Center for Eco Studies and Fish and Wildlife. So each of these yellow dots is a map, mapped potential pool. So you can go out um, and you can field confirm pools that were sent uh, remotely. And you can go see what's breeding there, see if it is or isn't a vernal pool. If you know of some pools that aren't mapped, you can add them to the map. Um, and all that gets automatically added to the Vermont Wetlands Inventory, which is used for a lot of um, developmental planning. And it's hard to protect vernal pools if we don't know they're there. And if they're not mapped, we can't really protect them. So the main goal for this is to really get a better sense of where they are, how many there are, and then be able to establish that there are breeding amphibians there, which will help give them those legal protections that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and this is the, the, uh, what the site looks like when you pull it up. Um, you log in, register there, and then once you do, you'll be able to add pools and add visits to the different pools. Um, just want to mention the Vermont Center for Studies Atlas of Life, which uh, a lot of this vernal pool stuff is part of. Uh, a lot of the data is contributed from iNaturalist, and that's where a lot of the information um, on the damselflies and dragonflies came from. 
Um, so that's another really cool thing to look at with. Love I I love iNaturalist I very much. So I thought I'd put a plug in for that. Um, yeah, and just thank you so much for sticking with us here. Here's my emails for questions. Here's Zach's email. Um, so I think we can open it up to the floor now for more questions. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we've got a little bit of time for questions. I've tried to keep up with them to some extent, but I'm sure there's a few that I've missed. And I can actually read some that um, some really good ones that folks asked. So some folks asked about um, maps and interested in seeing what amphibians live near them. Uh, the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas is a phenomenal resource. Uh, Jim Andrews has spent decades um, really figuring out where all of our reptiles and amphibians live throughout the state. And you can go online and see maps for each species and see what um, lives near you. So if you're interested in seeing what sort of animals, what sort of um, amphibians might live in your town, uh, you can go to the, the um, atlas and check that out. And I've provided a link um, in the chat box for that. Uh, someone else asked about Eastern Newts. Uh, kind of g going around uh, egg masses, and yes, indeed, uh, eastern newts are predators and will eat wood frog eggs and, and young larvae too. Um, I see it. I see a question um, about how to how do these uh, populations maintain genetic diversity because they don't travel far between their pools. Um, that's kind of a tricky question because sometimes they don't that's just kind of part of amphibians life history is that they just aren't well adapted to dispersing far and that's just how they evolved. So the best ways they maintain, or the best ways that we can help them maintain that genetic diversity because they've been surviving for this long doing their natural thing of not they, this, this breeding strategy works for them. And so it's not like, there's massive detriment. There's nothing like really detrimental about what they're doing, but we can influence it and make it a lot worse, which I think is where there's most of the issues coming up because when they're naturally kind of in these isolated populations, there's still got to be some some genetic exchange, or else it wouldn't have persisted this long. But when we um, are constructing roads that bisect their habitat that they can't cross there if they try, or if we're developing areas that they can't cross if they try to cross, that's when you start having the genetic diversity issues because they're still trying, they can try and they will migrate between populations usually, especially the young ones because they don't mature sexually the very first year. So they have time to disperse across the landscape, um, even if they're not actively breeding there at the time, but it's, when we start putting these barriers to dispersal up, that's when a lot of these genetic issues start arising. And amphibians have a really, um, a very malleable genetic code. <laughs> There's an example of, uh, like in, in Queens, New York, I think, or uh, the Brooklyn Bridge maybe, when it was constructed, it separated two redback salamander populations. And there's now, there's genetic diversity between these two populations now even though it's only, they're only separated by the one bridge, by the foundation of the bridge. So their amphibian genetic diversity is a really fickle thing. It's not quite as straightforward as ours. For instance, the, the, the blue-spotted Jefferson hybrid that Zach mentioned, those are usually triploid. Those usually have three sets of genes or more. You know, with us, we have two, one for mom, one for dad. They can have three, and all three could be from a different species. They could be one Jefferson one blue spotted and one small mouth or stream salamander, which is another part of the complex. So it's some it's like salamander, salamander diversity is just really like the neck diversity is a really crazy concept. Um, we have another question from Bronwyn uh, who asked about finding vernal pools. Um, I'm also excited to find more vernal pools in my area and wants to know if terrain maps uh, can be used to make an educated guess as to finding more unmapped pools. Any recommendations for those who are excited to get out in the woods and find new pools? Kind of. I'd say that terrain maps, not as much. Um, because when you're thinking of a, a vernal pool depression, 
maybe you know a hundred feet by a hundred feet, but it may only be a, a a foot a foot deep. So it's not going to show up on like topography maps. What we do use though is um, leaf off imagery. If you go to the Vermont Vernal Pool Atlas and you select Esri imagery, um, it's all photos, satellite photos from the fall or winter. I think it's from the fall when there's no leaves on the trees. So using those images from satellites with the leaves off, you can see the ground in a lot of places because most of the vernal pools are found in deciduous landscapes. So you can see large, dark depressions kind of um, either where there was standing water at the time or where there's just a shadow cast. And so there's, while terrain maps no, satellite imagery, yes. So before um, we take more questions, and I'm happy to stick around and answer more questions or have people email me, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. At one point, we had like 70 people joining us, so that was awesome. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you to folks who are um, North Branch Nature Center members and who have uh, supported us recently. Uh, if you are excited and wanting to learn more about amphibians, I'm going to be teaching um, an online interactive course all about um, amphibians starting in May. It'll go uh, for, it's uh, four sessions over six weeks, um, and it will be a mix of uh, some presentations, uh, some field work um, challenges, uh, and and uh, some special guests as well. So if you're excited to to dive into the the world of amphibians in Vermont, uh, you can join me for that course starting uh, the first week of May. And there's more information on our website. Uh, and thanks so much for Kevin for being here uh, and for all the work that VCE does. Yeah, totally. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, no, thanks for having for showing up. I really appreciate it. It's um. Always nice to talk to some other people outside of my roommates. So <laughs> I, I don't mind it one bit. Um, yeah, and I have nothing going on the rest of the day. I'm happy to answer more questions too. Please reach out to me um, for questions on Vernal Pools and property regarding you know mapping them and the atlas. It is new, so there might be some bugs. So let me know if you have any bugs or any suggestions. Um, yeah, just thanks for coming out. And yeah, let's answer more questions. Yeah, uh, um, we have a question about. Um, about using iNaturalist to document things, absolutely. It is uh, such a great tool uh, for, for documenting any living thing, um, definitely vernal pool creatures of all sorts. Um, iNaturalist is a great tool, and a lot of, research, a lot of researchers use the data that, um, that iNaturalist provides. Yeah. I see John asking uh, pop repopulation of vernal pools since... Vermont became reforested. That's a great. Um, that's a great question. I don't know of, off the top of my head of any research done on Vermont specifically. I think that Vermont's a really unique case in that instance, in how quickly and how how quickly the landscape changed and how widespread that change was. My, I don't know of any other you know northeastern states that have that same type of large scale changes. Um, my guess is that I, they, they repopulated. Um, I don't know necessarily where those repopulate, where they repopulated from. It could have been that from isolated, from like isolated woodlands in Vermont, they radiated out or it could be that, neighboring that the populations from the north from canada from maine or not from maine uh, from canada from new york new hampshire and massachusetts that they repopulated outside in and so i think it either is relatively low diversity at the moment because a small founder population repopulated the state or it could be high because all those other states repopulated interbred and now there's more diversity. So that, that's all, that's all like right now, like that's just me talking myself through it. I'd be really interested to know though. I don't know of any genetic studies such as that, but yeah. if anyone, wants, really cool. if anyone wants a PhD, 
Yeah. It's a great project for you to that study. Might be that. that might be what I do. Who knows? To study the genetic diversity of, uh, of amphibians in Vermont. I mean, think about we, we were covered in a glacier a mile thick. At that point, there, were, there was nothing living in Vermont, you know, on the land. Uh, so all the species that have come here, all the amphibians, have moved here, um, you know, over tens of thousands of years. Uh, and so, you know, repopulating a small area like Vermont over the course of 100 years or 150 years um, was, I don't think, as huge of a hurdle as, as uh, populating, you know, the, the north half of the continent after glaciation. Especially because we had soil on there 200 years ago. We didn't, right. we didn't 12,000. Right. Um, um, we, create, we have a great uh, question about a man-made pond that is similar to a vernal pool. Can you create small habitats like this that serve as breeding grounds? Absolutely. Yes. I just went to visit um, a, a pond um, the other day on a property in Hyde Park uh, that folks had. Um, it had previously been, been dug um, as a little pond, but they never uh, added added fish to it, and so it still meets some of the requirements of a vernal pool in that it's fish free. Um, you know, some vernal pools don't dry up every year. You know, one of the requirements was that seasonal drying, and and some don't dry up every year. Uh, mm -hmm. Some dry up every three or four years. Um, but really, the drying piece only. Um, only serves to to kill off the fish that live there. So if you have uh, something that meets the other requirements for a vernal pool, um, but doesn't dry out like a pond, um, as long as it doesn't have fish in it, um, you may get a, a breeding population of amphibians there as well. And and similarly, like um, Kevin was talking about earlier. Some of these species, like spotted salamanders and wood frogs, will will uh, will lay their eggs also in larger wetlands, and they're able to find places in larger wetlands that fish can't get to. So a wood frog might find a little pool on the edge of a large wetland complex that is just disconnected enough from the big, um, the larger wetland that fish can't get to it. So they're able to find within big wetland complexes these little tiny habitats um, that escape the fish predation. Yeah, I'd also add that when I'm when I like kind of did like the uh, you know like the three vernal pool requirements, n nature is never black and white. So even if it's not technically a vernal pool. And I'm saying, oh, they have to breed in vernal pools. I'm sure they don't have to. I'm sure there are spotted salamanders that will breed in areas with, with like, you know, a couple fish or anything. So that's, it's, that's kind of like a working definition, but there are always exceptions to the rule. Um, I guess you have to, when, you, when I think about amphibian habitat, I try and think of it from like the eyes of an amphibian. So they need a fishless body of water because they don't live in the water. They're not aquatic, so they can't protect their eggs. They don't hide their eggs. They don't have a nice hard shell on their eggs. So as long as there's a way that they can leave their eggs somewhere where they won't be consumed by primarily fish, but it could be, you know, an eastern newt as well, um, they're, they may be able to survive. It may not, maybe not high survival, but it might be able to happen. And so, yeah, totally. There's, and especially in Vermont, there's a big, with Vermont's uh, agricultural history, like, you know, every dairy farm or almost every farm had a, they, they would dig out, you know, a pit to flood with water for a pond to, you know, for, uh, you know, for like either themselves or for their cows to drink out of. And so all across the landscape, there are these old dugout pits that are now vernal pools. So, yeah, like, even if it's not intentionally for a pond, a lot of human activities will, you know, create some type of vernal pool that some amphibian, even just wood frogs, will use. Yeah, and, I mean, wood frogs are not terribly picky. <laughs> I've seen wood frog eggs 
um, laid in, you know, the track of a log skitter on a logging road. So just a little depression, you know, the little, um, uh, the, the little rut created by a log skitter that filled in after a rain, enough wood frogs found it and they, you know, they, there are a ton of eggs and likely those won't, you know, that, that rut is going to dry out before they complete their life cycle. Um, but the wood frogs found a spot that was, you know, wet and they just lay their eggs there. So it doesn't always work. That's the sort of gamble that these uh, animals are taking, um, that they may have found a new vernal pool that works perfectly for them, or they may have guessed wrong and, and the eggs dry out before they complete their life cycle. Yeah, some spotted salmoners will live to 20 years. They're long-lived creatures. Um, and like a lot of animals, they learn. And so young male salamanders may, like uh, I was talking to some of my coworkers yesterday, and um, they had a bunch of um, you know, the spermatophores, like the sperm packets that Zach mentioned. They were like, yeah, they're all just dropped in this roadside ditch. And, um, and he was like, yeah, that's not normal pool. And um, my other coworkers were like, yeah, they're probably like you know three like young men like young males that don't know how to breed. It's their first season. It's their second season. By five seasons in, they'll know more. And so there are so yeah, like I don't know. Wood frogs are only live to be like three, four, five maybe. So they also don't have the same time to experience what the spotteds do. Any other uh, questions? I think we've hit them all so far. Let's see, um, Leslie and on Vero Pools is a fabulous doctor. Yeah, totally. Um, there's no better way of learning about or um, of educating people on vernal pools than bringing them to a vernal pool. Um, it's hard to get someone really excited about a, th a depression that's four inches deep that's filled for two months out of the year. If you just describe that to them, it's kind of hard to get them. Like, oh, I got to go see it. Um, but you can get them out there and you look and you can just like, you know, take one scoop of leaf litter and you have 50 species in your hand of, of all the invertebrates that live there. You, know, you see all the tadpoles that are there. You really learn like how complex of an ecosystem it is. That's what I think really gets people into them. And so it's definitely easier to get that kind of that spark in someone's eye when you're actually looking at one and not just trying to describe a big mud pit, essentially. All right. Um, well, thank you all. And uh, we hope you uh, attend some of our future uh, presentations. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you everyone for coming out uh, again, email Zach or I with questions or anything. Um, I'd love, I'd love to talk more about Verna pools then, you know, just be inside, do anything else. So. All right. Take care, folks. Yeah.